Welcome to this Infectious Disease Detection and Surveillance Project webinar on the role of community-based surveillance in global health. This webinar is being recorded and all attendees are in listen-only mode. The recording will be available to everybody who registered later this week. You'll see on the right of your screen the control uh, bar. That's where our two handouts are available. Uh, the IDDS fact sheet and our surveillance technical approach. There's also the question box where you can enter any questions, which we'll try to address during our Q&A at the end of the program. So without further ado, over to Dorothy Pepra of USAID. Thank you so much, Tom. Hello, my name is Dorothy Pepra, um, and I'm a senior global health security advisor at USAID. I am part of the IDDS management team, along with Amy Pytek, COR, Sherry Kamen, Alt COR, and Gina Cicillata, our program manager. Welcome to the fifth of USAID's IDDS webinar series on community-based surveillance in global health security. Now, the international health regulations call for early warning systems for reporting and responding to public health events. There are two complementary types of surveillance, indicator-based surveillance and community event-based surveillance form the foundation of the functional early warning system. USAID through IDDS supports countries to strengthen their surveillance systems for priority and emerging diseases. These efforts focus on strengthening um, um, event-based surveillance system and improving and expanding community-based surveillance system, and also on increasing capacity for real-time analysis and notifications of disease events. Today, we're happy to welcome you and our experts from different parts of the world to share IDDS's experiences in supporting countries in building robust community-based surveillance systems. We also note that these systems emphasize a strong link between the diagnostics networks and the, the surveillance system. So thank you all for joining us. I hope the next hour will be enjoyable and enlightening for everyone who has attended. Over. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for those remarks and for providing context for the topic today. My name is Dudu Job, and I will be facilitating the webinar today. Next slide. Uh, first, uh, I hand it over to Ochi, the Deputy Director of IDDS. She will be providing us with the goal of this webinar and also the achievement of the IDDS project on CBS across the countries. Over to you, Ochi. Thank you, Dudu. And welcome to all our participants, attendees. I'll be sharing the goals for this webinar, as well as an overview of IDDS implementation on CBS across Sub-Saharan Africa and South, um, Southeast Asia. Our goals are to highlight the importance of community-based surveillance CBS in global health security, to share IDDS strategies and experiences supporting CBS implementation in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also to learn from our host country partners and implementers the major factors for institutionalizing CBS into the health systems. Community-based surveillance CBS refers to community indicator-based or event-based surveillance. In community indicator-based surveillance, a specific list of priority diseases based on case definitions are monitored by community agents. Whereas for event-based surveillance, the community agents monitor unusual events at the community level 
like a um, with a specific um, list of unusual health scenarios like a lot of children missing school or when you see a, an outbreak of um, bloody diarrheal diseases those are unusual events at the community level that the community agents would report recognizing that in most of the idds focus countries cbs implementation had been ongoing in a but in a fragmented manner our approach started with working with the host country partners to ensure better coordination and also facilitating appropriate use of data obtained so that these programs would be sustainable past the life of the capacity building that IDDS would provide or the pilots that we implemented. So IDDS approached CBS implementation in our focus countries by following, uh, focusing on the following areas, governance and resiliency with policy reviews, looking at best practices and standardizing existing tools across partners and across agencies, and making sure that these um, um, policies and um, tools and um, guidelines were then you know, um, transmitted to um, tra uh, into training um, and training the implementers. So we built technical capacity amongst the host country um, implementers based on the tools that had been revised and standardized and made sure that the training was linked to existing training platforms for sustainability purposes. Of course, from the health informatics perspective, IDDS ensured that the CBS activities were integrated into existing integrated disease surveillance and response frameworks in the countries that we supported, and also um, uh, attempted to introduce electronic reporting where feasible, so that these reports are incorporated into the national surveillance systems. Lastly, we helped to pilot some of the tools that we had standardized across countries, helped uh, uh, with successful pilots. We uh, supported um, development of expansion plans so that these um, um, CBS activities would go beyond just the pilot into additional regions and for coverage purposes. Um, the next, this slide shows uh, some of our, our, our overall achievements in terms of implementing CBS across the countries and over the past four years where we had been supporting activities. I'm not going to go into details with re listing these results as you can read them for yourself, but I just wanted to point out that overall we trained over 2,500 people on um, community based surveillance, with um, a majority of that being community health workers who would do the actual identification and reporting of. I also wanted to note that um, our indicator on looking at alerts um, reported and investigated, we only introduced in FY22, which, uh, by which time we were no longer implementing um, CBS activities in the countries highlighted, Burkina Faso, um, Guinea, and so on. And then lastly, in Vietnam, some of the results that we are reflecting show a combination of both community-based surveillance and indicator and event-based surveillance, both in animal um, health facilities and human health facilities, not just restricted to the community level. Now I'll go into details in terms of the um, what we did in the different countries. In Burkina Faso, we supported um, 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 standardization of tools, development of an expansion plan, and of course, um, following the um, the pilot that we had started, we were, you know, providing supportive supervision and um, overview for the um, uh, districts that we were supporting. We closed out our activity in Burkina Faso in July of 2021, but we note that the um, CBS implementation is still ongoing and supported through USAID's investment, the community, the country health information systems and data use project, CHISU, and has expanded CBS implementation into two additional regions beyond IDDS. In Guinea, we all know that Guinea being the country where we had the index case for um, the 2014 to 2016 Ebola outbreak, 
that the country was overwhelmed with multiple partners in implementing community-based surveillance activities. So as a first step, IDDS supported the national government to review existing policies, guidance, guidance documents, um, tools, and activities ongoing in CBS. Following that, we started a pilot on the standardized tools and by training community health workers in the Kindia region in, du in the Dubreka prefecture. But unfortunately, um, IDDS implementation in, uh, for CBS in Guinea was cut short with the, um, abruptly because of the COVID-19 um, outbreak, whereby uh, IDDS activities in Guinea solely focused on diagnostics. But that nonetheless, with COVID-19 funding, we were able to introduce or integrate COVID-19 into the existing CBS tools. In Mali, we continue to support over, um, CBS implementation, and we have done um, standardization of tools, dissemination of CBS tools. We have we've continued to work in um, Kadolo district where we had the pilot and expanded into additional districts. And we continue to uh, partner with the One Health platform in, Ga in Mali to support CBS implementation. In, in Senegal, we will, our work in Senegal was built upon the, ex, um, the work that um, measure evaluation had um, started in, in terms of training and developing of tools. And we built on, upon that and expanded to uh, training um, animal health and environmental officers use, uh, uh, um, utilizing the One Health approach. We have been supporting investigation of cases um, reported through the CBS. And we have made sure that um, the CBS activities are integrated into the government's existing electronic platform, the M Info Sante, um, for reporting. And activities are reported through that channel into the national surveillance systems. IDDS in its implementation has continued to prioritize the um, One Health approach. And so we have integrated um, CBS into animal health as well. In Burkina Faso, we did that because we were working through the multi -health, a sectoral One Health platform that had the representation from the animal health sector. I had, as I had mentioned in, in Guinea, we introduced um, COVID-19 um, tools into uh, uh, the existing CBS um, technical um, to, uh, training materials, working with the National Health Security Agency and the CBS Technical Working Group. And lastly, in, in Senegal, we have expanded surveillance of eight human and six um, animal prior, zoonotic priority diseases in the um, regions we, we, where we support, St. Louis and Tabacunda. Over our implementation period, which is like spans across four, like four years, some of the lessons that we have learned include the fact that um, a, a common challenge that uh, transits across the countries where we're working is that uh, community health workers and health volunteers are often not compensated. And so they have other um, priorities um, and high workloads because they have to make a living for themselves. They've also continued to complain about a lack or insufficient funds for them to be able to um, pro, um, report up using the, um, the telephones and the, 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 two, the send up signals as prompt as necessary. And of course, um, the fact that logistical um, challenges like um, lack of transport and um, lack of equipment at the community level continue to be a problem. With the, despite those challenges, some of the in, in, um, promising lessons or promising practices that we, have, we are able to report as IDDS is the fact that working closely with the national government ensures that CBS is integrated into their community health policies and plans for sustainability purposes and for compensating the community health workers. We've also um, no, uh, observed that supportive supervision and continuous training of the C um, community health workers and volunteers enable timely transmission of signals. And that with proper training and supervision, the community health workers and volunteers themselves actually are able to generate highly accurate alerts that match community case definitions. With that overview of um, IDDS implementation of CBS and um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll turn it over to Dudu to introduce our speakers and have the rest of the um, webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Ochi, for walking us through IDDS work on CBS across the countries. And now we will begin with a session led by Dr. Echen Lukwa, Emergency 
health information management and risk assessment manager at uh, the World Health Organization Regional Office for Africa. Agent, please proceed. Thank you very much, Dudu. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure to, to participate in this webinar, which is discussing the, the role of community-based surveillance for, in the context of global health security. It is also an opportunity to share WHO Afro's perspective, uh, the experience, and all the efforts that are being made by member states, the regional office, the hubs, emergency hubs, and also the country offices. Overall, for epidemiological surveillance, but also public health intelligence and community-based surveillance as one component of it. Uh, next slide, please. So, how we have one research? Yeah, that's fine. So the, as a background, and uh, this is a slide that I always um, present to show the high volume of outbreaks that we are dealing with in the Africa region. We are dealing with more than 100 outbreaks every year. Uh, this is actually based on uh, analysis that we conducted uh, for data coming from uh, 22 years of, uh, of data collection, which actually shows also an increase in zoonotic diseases outbreaks. So to reduce that volume of outbreak, uh, as well as the impact, our challenge is really to, to strengthen the capacity uh, to detect early and to monitor the outbreaks when they, ha they happen. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, this is an example to show you the volume that I'm, I'm talking about every single week. So this is a weekly uh, update as of last week. Um, uh, we we dealing with many of those events every single week. Uh, so as of last week, uh, we have 160 events that we are monitoring, uh, including 130 outbreaks, 35 outbreaks, and 25 humanitarian situations. So on average, we're dealing with two to three major events every week. And actually, that week, uh, the week last week, we had uh, four new events, which is actually much higher than we usually have. Our three events in, uh, in Senegal, as you can see, uh, Gino fever, Rift, Valley fever, and Chikuna uh, virus as well. And then we also have uh, an Alfras uh, suspected case in, uh, in Ghana. At the same time, we are receiving signals uh, for under verification in Cameroon and, and, and Mali. So as you can see at the bottom, uh, which is a whole list of uh, ongoing events uh, across multiple countries, sometimes same events in many countries, the same countries. So we're dealing really with uh, a large volume of events. Next slide, please. So the ideas are, as uh, my predecessor spoke about, have been implemented uh, in the Africa region for 25 years now. So since 1998, uh, we have now three generations of technical guidelines. Uh, and we have uh, you know, major implementation challenges. Some of those have been already highlighted. Uh, to mention a few on your right side here, you can see the financing piece of it, the leadership, the geographic coverage, uh, the training and laboratory capacity, which are really uh, become quite often as with many challenges. So these challenges also, as we can see every single week when we re receive data from member states, uh, was actually reflected in the completeness of the timeliness of the reporting. Next slide, please. So the task of transforming African surveillance system was initiated by AFRO in that regard to address those challenges and strengthen the public health surveillance and the laboratory systems. So TAF is the, one of the three flagship projects to strengthen health security. Uh, we have a two uh, pros, which is uh, looking at preparedness and surge focusing on response. TAF uh, has four pillars. Uh, the idea is to really support countries to scale up IDSI implementation, uh, actually at sub-national levels, the data management and informatics, workforce development and advocacy and policy dialogue. The main objective is to provide electronic support to IDSR to enable quicker detection, 
of disease outbreak. As we can see uh, from the challenges, it is a heavy process so that needs to be facilitated and simplified. And electronic solution might be a way to go to really uh, simplify that process. So, uh, you know, we have all intention to have a stronger integrated disease surveillance system and epidemic intelligence across Africa to enable quicker detection and action to prevent and timely respond to outbreaks. Next slide, please. So, on this slide, which is a, a, an overall framework uh, integrating the different uh, pieces of our efforts to conduct surveillance. Uh, as we build a larger system to really track uh, epidemics, um, the what we call epidemic intelligence platform is really to help uh, integrate with different pieces of, uh, of surveillance as a pivotal framework to decisively impact prevention, uh, early detection, and uh, timely response. So this is actually integrating uh, community-based surveillance, facility-based surveillance, event-based surveillance, laboratory. One health surveillance, and of course, the indicator base, which is uh, one of the pieces that we will focus on. We have been focusing on for quite some time. Next slide, please. So, um, to specifically speak to uh, community based surveillance, uh, IDSR integrates community based surveillance in its high guidelines. Uh, but so far, the focus has been really on facility based. Uh, surveillance indicator base, which I just highlighted. Um, see on this slide here, you can see from the guidelines that the reporting structure for community alert and verification events is, is, is there. And actually the idea is to be able to capture all the events from the community sources. Um, the, the issue that we'll talk to it, it will speak to that is more on, on the implementation level. So we craft the, the flow of the information from the community to the facility districts to the progress and up to the national level and the different steps as an algorithm to really uh, act from, from the community workers uh, from, the, from the ground up to the national level. Next slide, please. So this is, um, I just wanted to go back to some of the, the earlier results uh, from a survey that we conducted back in uh, May 2022, last year. Uh, which shows some of the results around event-based surveillance and uh, community-based surveillance in terms of implementation levels. So, um, as you can see here, and I can quickly summarize, um, out of the 44, 5, 45 countries that responded to the survey, about um, 31 of them uh, actually reported that they implement EDS in, in overall. Um, but actually, when you look at it closer, it is only 14 of them who implement EBS uh, at national level and uh, also, also at district level. Um, there are other 14 countries that actually do not, do not implement EBS at all. And nine countries do implement at uh, national level only and three um, where you know, about 50% of their districts do have uh, some level of uh, EBS. Um, so, Coming back to community-based surveillance, uh, which is our focus today, it, it is really not effective to say so. So in that same survey, 32 of the 45 countries that were surveyed indicated that they, they, are, they still need to, you know, they, they are using uh, community-based surveillance, but really when you go down to the data, you can see that there is a lot more to do in terms of level of implementation and proper implementation. So from those 42 countries, um, it, many of them, actually 29 of them, uh, developed guidelines to help health workers to complete their tasks, including 23 countries that have guidelines covering all the diseases or conditions under surveillance. So this to us is uh, still a limited number of countries as we think larger and regional level to really integrate more data and understand what is going on to be able to capture the events early. Next slide, please. So uh, in the same vein, you have uh, the, the community alert reporting form, which is also part of the IDSR technical guidelines. Uh, these are some examples. Uh, actually, it's next slide, because the previous one was repeated. Next slide, please. 
Right. So um, some of those examples from community alert reporting from, you know, from completed by uh, a focal point in the community, submitted immediately to a nearest facility or sub uh, district level. Uh, those are, you know, tools that are there really to help capture the events uh, that are happening at the, at the community level. And they are powerful, but the problem is really the actual use of it. And also because we, it is so much a paper base, uh, and the burden is high, and that is not always effective. And so uh, what we're trying to do is really to change the way uh, things are happening. And I've heard, we'll probably hear some examples from the country's implementation uh, to really come down to more electronic support to, to really change the way those forms can be used quickly to, to capture the, 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 the information at, at community level. Next slide, please. Yes. So in the same way, the community-based uh, suspected diseases, diseases and public health events, which is a monthly log sheet, provides a line, a line listing of all the events and, uh, and uh, alerts during the week, the month, sorry. So the transportation that is needed is really to migrate from all these tools again to electronic version, because uh, as you can see, this will be certainly piling up and the use of it uh, will be difficult to compile and analyze the data. So that is exactly what we're trying to do at the regional level and uh, to try to really uh, improve that process. We do know that member states recognize the importance of these tools, but the actual use of them is, is pretty difficult. Next slide, please. So I'll end this presentation with some examples, basically some images from the communities. Most of them are focused on, on COVID-19 activities, but the strategy is really that detection uh, can also happen for many other conditions when we are doing activities around uh, certain pathogens. So for example, um, risk communication activities, risk uh, and communication engagements uh, with communities uh, actually uh, here, as you can see, also provide an opportunity to, to see things that are happening, test, and come up with some other uh, results. So those are really important. The next, please. Right. So the same way, um, you know, conducting community-based testing, even at the time of COVID, uh, when things were really into a uh, uh, very, very active phase, um, you know, those activities are also generating other, other important information about conditions that are, are not usual in the community that can be quickly reported. Various visits or distribution of, of supplies uh, also help uh, identify cases uh, sometimes and also contacts, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So one other thing that is also important is really, uh, you know, the review of uh, records uh, captured at health facility level. Uh, sometimes uh, reviewing those records, you can find something that uh, we actually miss. Uh, and so um, those are really important. And again, it comes back to the data use, of, you know, really looking at what we are collecting because those can actually help us detect uh, something else that we were not actually expecting. Uh, supervision activities are important, um, also help uh, identify some of the issues as we try to understand uh, deeper what was actually recorded on those forms with the actual uh, health workers on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this is the end of, of my presentation. I want to thank you very much and I'll be available for questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne, for walking us through your experience on community-based surveillance and the regional approach or perspective with the Transforming African Surveillance System flagship project. And now, here is our next speaker, uh, Dr. Yakuba Kone, to speak about his experiences of implementing community-based surveillance in Mali. Welcome, Yakuba.
Ok, merci beaucoup, euh, bien des choses. Euh, donc, j'ai l'honneur de vous partager euh, l'expérience du Mali en, en termes de surveillance à base communautaire. Alors, euh, ce qui se passe, passe au Mali euh, depuis 2020 jusqu'à nos jours. Euh, next slide. Diapo. Alors, pour ce faire, je vais enfin vous présenter les plans euh, que je vais vous que je vais adopter pour la présentation. Donc, après une introduction, donc on va passer à l'étape, on va faire une revue sur les différentes étapes de la mise en place de ces bacs. On va parler de quelques résultats et on va conclure. Diapo. Alors, donc en introduction, je dirais que la CEBAC est une initiative de santé publique, simple, adaptable, peu coûteuse, générée par la communauté pour se protéger contre les maladies à potentiel épidémique et événements. L'évolution de la maladie à potentiel épidémique a montré l'importance de la veille au niveau communautaire et du renforcement du concept initial santé dans la surveillance et la réponse aux urgences de santé publique par la détection, la confirmation et la réponse. Judy, we're not hearing anything. I'm not sure if it's just me. La direction générale de la santé et de l'hygiène publique, avec l'appui des partenaires techniques et financiers, a élaboré un guide et les outils standardisés de ces bacs dans les années 2020 et a mis en place, a mis en œuvre une phase pilote. CEBAC afin d'identifier les éventuelles, éventuelles insuffisances et avant la mise à l'échec. Ceci a été suivi de l'élaboration d'un plan d'installation de CEBAC et qui a commencé euh, dans les années 2021. Diapo. Alors, ce diapo nous montre les différentes étapes de mise en place de CEBAC au Mali. Donc, euh, nous avons, après euh, le guide, l'élaboration et la validation du guide national de CEBAC et les outils, il y a eu la phase pilote à Kadjolo en septembre 2020, euh, suivie d'une évaluation de ce, euh, et l'élaboration du plan d'extension. L'extension a, a commencé à partir de 2021 dans les districts de Kati et Kangama. Et c'est poursuivi à Kolonjeba et à Segaso en 2022. Diapo. Alors, ce graphique nous montre les, les circuits des données, des équipements. Alors, il faut dire que et, les, les informations sont transférées à partir des téléphones. De, 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 par la communauté euh, au niveau du district. Dudu, sorry, many of us cannot au niveau de la communauté, hear the, les the webinar and we're not les agents de able to see the slides. It may be a partial transfer à son tour au niveau du okay, de, de district. Et les chargés de surveillance au niveau du district et collectent les données, font les tri et puis euh, ils voient ce qui sont euh, et des menaces et puis euh, ils les transfèrent dans un fichier Excel et puis ils sont aussi traités à l'aide d'un fichier Excel et traités et, 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 et qui sont versés dans les, les DCD, les DHHT. Diapo. Alors, vous dire que voilà un peu aussi euh, le processus, comment les, les, les données sont aussi remontées. Donc, des ASC, des sites ASC, les informations sont transmises au niveau de, c'est ce que je disais, au niveau de CESCOM, au niveau des DTC, donc des directeurs techniques de CESCOM, des centres, qui à leur tour envoient les informations au niveau du district sanitaire, au niveau des chargés de surveillance au niveau district. Et aussi, ils envoient l'information au niveau régional, au niveau des chargés de surveillance, au niveau et régional. Alors, qui, après traitement des données et l'envoi. Diapo. Ici, c'est quelques résultats en termes de formation et d'équipement. Donc, les districts sanitaires dans la première colonne. Le nombre de DTC formés dans la deuxième colonne, les ASC formés dans la troisième colonne, les points focaux dans la, dans la quatrième colonne. 
et le total formé dans les districts euh, dans la cinquième colonne. Ceci étant, donc euh, à Sigasso, il, euh, il y a eu 47 DTC, directeurs techniques qui ont été formés, 87 agents de santé communautaire, 3 points focaux, ce qui fait un total de 138. Et puis, euh, ils ont été dotés de euh, 135 téléphones et puis un ordinateur, un flybox et, et un disque du, du, du SM. À Colombia, c'était 23 pour les DTC, 86 pour les ASC, 3 pour au niveau 3 points focal, 125 euh, personnes formées au total pour le district et 110 plus de téléphones qui ont été remis à ces gens et un ordinateur, un flybox et un disque du SM. À Kadjolo, c'est 26 et DTC, 72, 72 ASC, 3, 3 points focaux, 100, 103 au total, et 99 téléphones et puis distribués, un ordinateur portable, un flybox, et il n'y a pas eu de distribution externe là-bas. À Kati, c'est 15, 15 DTC, 42 ASC, 3 points focaux, 60 personnes formées au total, 58 plus au téléphone distribué. Tangaba, c'est un total de 75, 77 personnes formées pour euh, 75 plus et téléphone distribué, un ordinateur, un flybox, un distribué. Au total, il faut retenir qu'au Mali, euh, il y a eu 133 DTC, euh, 339 ASC, et 15 points focaux euh, sur un total de 503 personnes formées, euh, avec 477 puces distribuées, 5 ordinateurs, 5 flybox et 3, 3, 3 disques durs externes. Diapo, s'il vous plaît. Alors, donc il faut dire ici, en termes de notification des maladies, nous avons ici quelques résultats qui ont été détectés par les districts. Donc, en 2020, c'est Kadjolo qui a notifié quatre maladies et 103 événements. Ça, c'était la phase pilote. En 2021, Kadjolo a notifié 23 maladies et 460, 460 événements. Donc, Kagawa a notifié 15 maladies et 112 événements. Kati, 35 maladies et 122 événements. En 2022, Kadjolo a notifié 23 maladies et 182 événements. Kangawa, 51 maladies et 114 événements. Kati, 42 maladies et 196 événements. Sigasso, 111 maladies et 92 événements. Kolonjewa, 154 maladies et 255 événements. Donc, en 2023, pour le premier trimestre, donc, c'est deux maladies pour Kadjolo, 73 événements. Kangawa, trois maladies, 17 événements. Kati, cinq maladies, 26 événements. Sigasso, deux maladies et un événement. Kolonjewa, huit maladies et 289 événements. Japo. En conclusion, il faut retenir que le contexte actuel de la globalisation nous pousse à aller vers la, la surveillance basée sur les, la surveillance à base communautaire qui s'avère indispensable pour disposer d'un système de, de surveillance intégrée de la maladie et des ripostes performants. La contribution de la CEVAC dans l'efficacité de la surveillance intégrée de la maladie et de la riposte est avérée aujourd'hui et elle devrait être mise en échelle pour renforcer la performance du système de la SMR. Un système de surveillance intégrée de la maladie efficace permet de détecter, confirmer et répondre à temps réel, ce qui contribuera à la réduction de la morbidité et de la mortalité liée aux maladies sous surveillance. Diapo. Diapo. Alors, donc, ça, c'est un exemple d'image de, 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 qui est là, donc, au cours d'un événement, d'une de, 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 activité dans la communauté. Alors, euh, où, où ces, ces images ont été prises là-bas en, en guise d'exemple. Euh, je vous remercie.
Uh, some of you may not have seen that uh, recording of Yakuba due to a pop-up block. So um, look for the pop-up block. Uh, a second window will open the next time. If you didn't see it, it will be on the recording that will be available later this week. So back over to Udu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yakuba, for sharing your experiences from Mali. Uh, now we will have our final speaker, Mwane Job, uh, take us through the community-based surveillance implementation approach in Senegal. Now everybody remember to watch for the second window. Je m'en vais vous présenter la mise en œuvre à base communautaire selon l'approche d'une seule santé au Sénégal. Avance. Carmen, sorry to la cellule de santé communautaire du ministère de la Santé fédérale au Sénégal est mise en place la stratégie because a window Comité does veille, come up, but we're not able to connect to the pay. Avec des That's the problem. Qui était sage d'appuyer les programmes de santé maternelle et infantile. Les groupes au début composés exclusivement de femmes. Par la suite, la surveillance épidémiologique a été rajoutée au paquet de services des membres de CEPAC. À la mise en œuvre de la surveillance à base communautaire, selon l'approche d'une seule santé. Les auxiliaires d'élevage du ministère de l'élevage et les éco-gardes du ministère de l'environnement ont intégré au groupe CEVAC. Ce groupe porte maintenant le nom de CEVAC-I, pour dire CEVAC intégré. Avance. Le gouvernement du Sénégal a identifié huit maladies humaines et six zones qui doit faire l'objet d'une surveillance à tous les niveaux de la pyramide sanitaire. Il s'agit de la poliomyélite, la rougeole, la fièvre jaune, la tétanos, le tétanos néonatal, la diarrhée sanglante, le choléra, la méningite et les maladies hémorragiques virales, Ebola et Marbouk pour, pour la santé humaine. Et le rage, la tuberculose bovine, la grippe aviaire, la fièvre de la vallée du rip, l'anthrax et les maladies hémorragiques virales, Ebola et Marou pour l'approche d'une seule santé. Avance. La formation des acteurs communautaires a été assurée par les infirmiers chefs de poste ICP et les chefs de poste vétérinaires CPV. Dans notre localité Afia, La formation a été assurée par notre infirmière et le chef de poste vétérinaire de Tambacounda. Ces derniers disposaient le flip chart qui comportait les définitions des cas de maladie sous surveillance. Le schéma général de la surveillance à base communautaire, un module sur l'utilisation du téléphone pour la transmission des signaux et un dernier module sur la visite à domicile et les messages clés à partager lors des sciences de sensibilisation des populations. Les acteurs communautaires de la, santé commun de la santé humaine et ceux de la santé animale ont été regroupés et formés ensemble sous les mêmes maladies et les mêmes modules. À la fin de la session de formation, chaque acteur communautaire a reçu un aide-mémoire en fonction de la langue de son choix entre le pensée, le et le mandat. Au sort de la session de formation, tous les acteurs communautaires étaient outillés pour pouvoir notifier aussi bien les maladies humaines et les, que les maladies zoonotiques. Sur ces images, nous avons des photos des pages de couverture du Philippe Chat et de l'aide de mémoire à Mandin et un groupe de femmes acteurs communautaires qui détiennent leurs aides de mémoire. Avance. Le schéma de la surveillance à base communautaire fait intervenir au niveau communautaire essentiellement trois acteurs 
à savoir l'infirmière, le chef de poste vétérinaire et l'acteur communautaire. Les acteurs communautaires procèdent à la recherche active des cas à travers les visites à domicile, mais également reçoivent des informations sur les maladies ou des événements de la part des populations. À chaque qu'ils reçoivent une information, ils envoient un signal par SMS, soit à l'ICP s'il s'agit d'une maladie humaine ou au chef de poste vétérinaire s'il s'agit d'une maladie animale. Parfois, il nous arrive d'envoyer des signaux à l'infirmière et au chef de poste vétérinaire, notamment pour les cas de morsures d'animal. À l'infirmière, on signale le nombre d'individus mordus et au chef de poste vétérinaire, on signale l'animal mordeur. L'application m -Info Santé a été installée sur les téléphones des acteurs communautaires pour leur permettre d'envoyer gratuitement des signaux par SMS et recevoir, recevoir les, les feedbacks des infirmiers et les chefs de poste vétérinaires également par SMS. Le numéro court 21 345 a été attribué à l'application Info Santé pour le gouvernement du Sénégal. Une fois que les UCP et CPV reçoivent les signaux, ils nous envoient un accusé de réception. Puis, ils classent le signal. Il s'agit d'un cas suspect de maladie sous surveillance. Ils descendent sur le terrain pour procéder à la vérification du signal et rechercher d'éventuels d'autres cas. Lorsqu'il s'agit d'une zoneuse, une investigation conjointe, santé humaine, santé animale est effectuée. Lors de la vérification des signaux et des investigations conjointes, l'acteur communautaire fait part de l'équipe et la guide au sein de la communauté. Lors des activités de réponse aux maladies également, l'acteur communautaire fait partie de l'équipe et joue un rôle important dans la sensibilisation des populations. Avance. Récemment, d'importants résultats ont été obtenus dans la surveillance par la poste de santé affaire du district sanitaire de Tambacounda grâce à l'investigation des acteurs communautaires. Six signaux courage ont été envoyés à l'ICP. Ils ont tous été vérifiés et classés comme cas suspects de rougeole. Des prélèvements de sang ont été effectués par l'ICP, puis envoyés au MCT qui les a envoyés à son tour au laboratoire. Les résultats des six prélèvements sont revenus positifs. Par la suite, l'équipe du district et l'ICP ont organisé une réunion de sensibilisation avec les leaders d'opinion de la zone, plus des séances de sensibilisation communautaire. Enfin, une campagne vaccinale contre la rougeole a été organisée par la zone du poste de santé à faire. Six cas de morsures de chiens ont été signalés par les acteurs communautaires. Des signaux courage ont été envoyés à l'ICP et un signal courage au CPV. L'ICP, le CPV et les acteurs communautaires ont procédé à une investigation conjointe. Le chien a été attrapé et un prélèvement effectué par le CPV puis envoyé au laboratoire vétérinaire à Dakar. Les résultats des analyses sont revenus positifs pour le rage. Les enfants sont toujours pris en charge par l'équipe médicale du district sanitaire de Tambacounda et reçoivent les vaccins anti-rabides. Merci de votre attention. Again, if you didn't see uh, Ngoni's presentation because of a pop-up, you will see it on the recording. So now I'll back over to Dudu. Thank you, Dudu. Thank you, Tom. And thank you also, Ngoni, for sharing your insight from Senegal. We have now reached the final part of our program with questions and answers. If you have a question for any of our panelists, please feel free to enter them into the chat window and we will direct them to the group for a response. I would like to start the Q&A session by asking a question to Dr. Etienne from WHO AFO. Uh, Etienne, I, I would like to know if 
community-based surveillance protocol do change during emergencies. Thank you very much, Dr. Diop. So the protocols as such do not change. So basically the guidelines that are provided in the IDSR as part of the, to actually implement the community-based surveillance does not change. But the, what is changing during emergency is to really focus on very quickly activating whatever is possible to get surveillance working. So in that sense, um, what we have seen on the ground is that things that are don't, don't necessarily work well during a routine activities. I mentioned during uh, my presentation that routinely community-based surveillance is not really well implemented, but for uh, in an emergency, you will see that there is more motivation to do it because we have no choice. We have to respond and we have to really limit the transmission. And so you will see that um, you will get more and more involvement uh, of the community workers, volunteers. You will also see more uh, supervision uh, because we really have to act. And unfortunately, that's how uh, things work, uh, but then once we are over the, the emergency, we tend to go back to the routine, which is not exactly the way we would have we would hope. We have observed this in the recent outbreaks in the cholera case uh, in Malawi, uh, the MB, MPD in Equatorial Guinea, even the SD, SDV in uh, Uganda, where we really see uh, that our response is actually working much better because of the, the, the community workers are helping with anything around prevention and uh, help push. Thank you. I have two other questions for you. The, my next question is about the recent outbreak of uh, infectious diseases. You have shared great examples of uh, community health work during the COVID-19 pandemic. And now I would like you to walk us through some example of uh, community health work uh, during the recent outbreak of Ebola virus disease and Marburg virus disease in some African countries. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you very much. Actually, you should have uh, put some pictures also from the, the, the most recent events. Uh, I've been sticking to the, the, the COVID features. But yes, um, the, the community work workers' contribution has been very critical in their responses um, to really break the, the chain of transmission. Uh, the typical activities uh, are really the messaging, very messaging, uh, you know, uh, the, the public health uh, information, uh, distribution of flyers, the, the visits to households, uh, in many cases, um, the linking with suspected cases to the facility, uh, you know, uh, we have community work, community um, volunteers that are really used as part of WHO's interventions to really act uh, very quickly. Uh, so uh, in Malawi, for example, um, it was very really critical to, to focus on, on the community workers to distribute tablets at, at the households, um, pass on messages, really uh, uh, reduce the transmission with very simple messages sometimes. So um, these are examples that I can cite, but really it's all around the, the messaging, the contact tracing, uh, being able to reach the, the right people on the right time, uh, which we cannot really uh, do much without really to, 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 to stop the transmission. Thank you. I have one more question for you. Uh, I know you are leading all health information systems across uh, the region. And as you know, health information system is closely linked to surveillance. Surveillance is supported by health information system. And I am wondering how, at the regional level, what approach or strategies are in place to support member states 
to incorporate the community-based surveillance data into the overall surveillance data or reports they are sharing with the regional level. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in my presentation, I actually uh, mentioned a little bit of that, um, how Afro is working towards the integration and triangulation of different sources of information coming from the, the different surveillance systems. So community-based surveillance, event-based surveillance are being integrated in a, in a tooling platform. Uh, currently, what we are building is a centralized regional platform for, for surveillance, uh, which integrates, uh, we started with IDSR, Finally, we have a, a regional IDSR platform uh, that member states can use. And so we're building on top of that the event-based piece. Uh, currently, we're using EOS epidemic intelligence from open source system, um, but the, the link is actually being established just like Africa Citizen has done to, to really get the data back to a DHIS2. Uh, so that actually in one single environment, we can interact between the IDSR data, we, between the uh, EOS uh, data, which is event based, uh, and then community based information that was also captured. But again, uh, these are work in progress. Uh, we, are, we have that design, the entire system, we're now working on these different pieces to put things together, and it will take uh, certainly a little more time to have our, our member states really uh, integrate the data into it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Etienne, for providing this clear answer to the questions. Uh, I have a quick question from Goni from Senegal. Uh, since she is speaking only in French, I will ask my question first in French and then translate it into English. Uh, Goni, j'ai une question pour vous. Je voudrais juste savoir quels sont les défis que vous rencontrez sur le terrain dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre de la surveillance à base communautaire. And my question to Ngoni is, my question is just related to challenges they are facing in implementing the community-based surveillance approach in the area of the health of shield covering. Allez, Ngoni. Oui, parfois, les, 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 les patients refusent d'aller au poste de santé par manque de moyens, parce que c'est une population euh, diminuée. On a aussi on a aussi des problèmes de téléphone. Euh, si, si, si on a si on a si on envoie les SMS aux ICP, si on n'a pas de, de, de réseau, les signaux ne vont ne, ne vont pas atteindre euh, aux ICP. D'accord, merci beaucoup. I, I will just translate quickly her responses. She was just saying that uh, in the community-based surveillance approach implementing in Senegal, they, when they identify someone with symptoms, they have first to send a signal to the nurses and also to direct the, the person who is sick in brackets to the closest health force. And very often people do not are not willing to go to the health force because of the cost of the treatment they have to pay there. And the second challenge is related to the network. Since the system is an SMS based, if the network is not strong, sometimes they can send the signals to the nurse, but the nurse will not get it uh, promptly. Merci beaucoup, Ngone, pour uh, les réponses. Now I'm checking questions in the chat. Uh, so far, we don't have much questions here. Maybe I can ask one question to the Mali team. Seru, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, my question is as follows. I, I, I'm wondering after four years of implementation of the community-based surveillance in five selected districts, what is the impact of the CBS 
on the quality and the overall surveillance system compared to other health districts that are not implementing right now the community based surveillance. Over to you, Saidu. It seems he can't hear us. So I have a question in the panel. Uh, the question is related to the One Health work. And we are asking if uh, animal health and human health officials at local level have access to the same CBS platform to conduct a joint investigation and response. This question is more for the Senegal team, but uh, I think I am the most appropriate person here to answer to that question because I was working both for measure evaluation when we launched this community based surveillance approach using One Health, using One Health approach in Senegal, and we transitioned activities to IDBS as well. Yes, they do use in the field the same software, which is M Infosante. M Infosante is an open source software based on Rapid Pro, and that uh, software allows to share information at the local level. But when they get the information at the health force or animal health, they have two different systems. At health force, they use the DHIS2. They have the Kubuntu box. That is a, at the animal health force, they only difference but in the field they are using exactly the same software uh do do um Seydou said he couldn't unmute you don't have any more question in the... sorry it's just uh, Seydou said he couldn't unmute himself, unfortunately. Sorry, Dudu. Um, carry on with the Q&A. I'm sorry, 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 for, sorry about that. Uh, I have here a question from Sherry for HN. And he, the question is related to the number of uh, countries that have fully implemented IDSR as shown in the Afro survey. Uh, what do you think can be done to further encourage not to rule out of IDSR programming. Is it a financial yes. constraint or not? Yes. So th thank you very much for this question. Um, yes. So basically, we did, Afro conducted uh, is the survey, part of the survey that I discussed, but also we have uh, in country consultation by sub region. And we were able to talk to all the member states to discuss IDS implementation. Uh, because when we saw the data back in May 2022, you know, we really were very, very below uh, expectation. And so the, the number one issue with IDS implementation is financial. Um, is it's finances. So uh, what we have done is we have worked with some partners to to look for some, some funding. And we started what we call the task acceleration project, so which is the, the same task that we're discussing, transforming African surveillance system. But, uh, you know, really going even faster than we, we anticipated. So we've been able to, um, to, to put 28 countries already on that program. 
uh, will be a little bit of funding, so we call it seed funding, and we're already seeing a lot of good results. So actually, if we have to go back and do the survey again this year, the, the, the picture will change. We have already seen some dramatic changes over time in terms of the completeness and timeliness of reporting IDSR data, for example, from 10 countries uh, that were reporting consistently back in May 2022, we are now at 35 countries that are reporting and the timeliness has increased uh, dramatically. So um, yeah, I have to say there's a lot of progress uh, based on that, but again, it was based because simply we're able to fund some of the activities and moving forward, we, we hope that many of the issues around data management, around tools, around scale up to some national level would have been resolved. Uh, we still miss a couple of countries um, where we really need to have a, a strong action again, but we are working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. Uh, you, you, the data you share has shown us a limited member states are currently implementing community based surveillance system. And how do we envision community based surveillance being expanded in cross border efforts in the West African region? Is there any appetite for that? I imagine that was also my question to be. All right. So, <laughs> cross border uh, surveillance is critical, and there is a lot of room for, to do that. Um, currently, what we have been doing most recently is through the Redise project. The World Bank uh, covering just in, in Central Africa. Uh, WHO Afro was given that piece of a project to, to strengthen the cross border surveillance. And that is something that we are, we are undertaking. Um, our colleagues that are working on preparedness are also working uh, hard on you know, joint external evaluations. We are looking at preparedness levels of countries. Basically, what we do is, uh, as soon as there is an event in one country, we quickly look at the preparedness of all of the other countries around, so basically cross-border-wise. And so there is a really a concern because we've seen a lot of those um, events when they happen that quickly propagate to, uh, you know, to uh, across the border. Uh, and so um, it is a, it's a priority, I have to say. Of course, the limitation again is more on the funding levels. Um, from who we already say we the funding that we got is really limited, but we try to really get it to work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, as a regional expert, you will have uh, almost <laughs> all the questions because we really would like to know what are the strategies the regional organization is putting in place. And uh, uh, my next question is about uh, uh, resources. You know, in health programs, we need to have a good level of funding and also expert in the field to implement high quality activities. But my question is more related to the resources, I mean the funding. Uh, for uh, how resources settings, for low resources settings, how do we sustain the community health work to continue detecting signal in our community? Absolutely important. Of course, we are talking about, I mean, actually local resource uh, setting is for most of our member states, actually. Of course, we are at different levels, but um, overall, we're running at a low level uh, resources for most of our member states. And so, um, as I showed a little bit, the, the primary guidelines are there. The implementation can happen. The problem is that it is heavy. Uh, most countries have really uh, integrated the guidelines. We have adopted it. Uh, we have done the TOTs and tried to get it down to a sub-national level. Um, the, what we're trying to do is we found out that the whole process is heavy. Uh, by the time you look at your data, you're already you know, behind. And the, uh, the, the outbreak is already ongoing. 
So how can we do this very, very fast? That's where the you know, resources are important to move from the traditional ways of operating uh, with the paper base uh, to really get to more electronic uh, support where information can re re be passed on very, very quickly. And those of obviously will need a little bit of uh, you know, financing. Um, our strategy is really to to talk, take, talk to the member state themselves to try to mobilize some local resources uh, because we have to do it by ourselves at one point anyway. But you know, before that, we kind of look for any possible uh, funding that can come in to to, to start some of these projects. Uh, and so uh, I think it is key, uh, but. Really, the commitment is the number one thing that we think is important. That, but we are seeing that we're seeing the countries really committed to do it, uh, particularly after COVID. We are all really aware of uh, you know the, the danger that is around, and that is really motivating. Um, but um, well, one thing I can say is, uh, at global level, I think it's all well understood. Now we can also we cannot also leave uh, countries behind. So there are a lot of uh, global initiatives to for funding as well. Um, currently, as you know, the, the preparedness funding um, that we are, countries are now are, you know applying for. There are other initiatives. We have a collaborative uh, surveillance at headquarters uh, that involves all of the, the countries. We have another project called the data preparedness. That will involve all the countries. Uh, so, and that is not only for Africa; it's for the global all of, for all of us. So, we're looking at how can we all really uh, share the burden of uh, funding in terms of really getting everyone to be prepared because it's not for one country; it's for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, we are running out of time. Uh, I would like to close the Q and A session here and hand it over to Dorothy Pripa from USAID for the closing remark. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dorothy. If, if she is not able to hear us, I will hand it over to Ochi for the closing remark. Over to you, Ochi, please. Thank you, Dudu. And um, I would like to thank all the participants, um, our attendees, thank our presenters for joining us this morning or afternoon, depending on your, what time you are in. Um, and also apologize for um, those attendees who were unable to click onto the um, pop-up window for the um, um, recorded presentations and to note that the presentations would be in the recording that will be shared um, at the end of this week. And um, with that, I would like to say thank you and um, thank um, turn it over back to Dudu to close us out. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending this uh, webinar. This is the last one of the series that IDDS has implemented. And we are looking forward for other common activities and opportunities to share our work, our achievements, and also what we are envisioning for the countries we are supporting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. The presentation has end ended. Everyone who registered will receive a recording later this week. Thank you very much for attending. Have a good day.